Welcome to this installment of Bergeron Briefs. My name is Art Bergeron. Uh, for those of you who haven't seen this show, I'm an attorney. I work at Myrick O'Connell. There are 60 of us, uh, 20 in uh, Westboro and 40 in Worcester. I do nothing but elder law. I work mainly out of the Westboro office. Um, I come here um, to supplement seminars that I do that are regarding a number of elder law topics, really to help you get to know the people that you need to know as a senior who is dealing with any number of issues, uh, and also to help you understand the programs that are available, um, and just to, just to help you. In, 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 and the area that we're going to be talking about today is one that's probably the most common area that I talk to my clients about, and that's um, um, staying home, staying home, even as you get older, and even if you start getting, starting to get dementia, which is everyone's greatest fear. And with me to talk about this is Josh Freitas. Josh, thank you very much for joining us here. Thank you for having me. Uh, Josh, I had um, heard about your wonderful presentation re recently to the Metro West Alzheimer's Partnership and wanted to bring you on the show just to talk to folks about this whole cluster of issues surrounding people who have dementia and their caregivers, how they can deal with that when they're at home, at what point, they should be considering assisted living or other options. To talk about that, that all, all of that, which, which, which I know that you deal with day to day. So tell us first, or tell me first, a little bit about you. What are you doing? Why are you doing it? What have you been doing recently? Sounds good. Talk uh, to me. So my name is Josh Freitas. I'm the Corporate Memory Care and Resident Engagement Director for LCB Senior Living. And you have to make sure you talk to us slow. I I'm, I'm, I'm getting old. I have trouble on this. Street, right? <laughs> um, a big part of my job is to help people with dementia continue to flourish. Um, the numbers are staggering. Currently, there's 5.6 million Americans living with Alzheimer's, and that, and that number is supposed to fourfold in the next 30 years. Um, so with that in mind, um, kind of preparing the next generation to have vibrant lives. Mm -hmm. So having them um, really have control of their life as well. So for example, one of the things we did in our, our Bedford community was um, I want what, what, what do you do for a living? What do I do for a Again. living? Um, I am a student as well as um, I work professionally as a corporate director. I get it. I get it. And you work in, 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 in or with a lot of assisted living facilities? I work with a company that we will have almost 19 communities at the end of this month. I see. Um, so really putting services together that support not just the resident, but yeah. also their families or even their friends. OK. So now tell me about what you're doing in the context of Definitely. Yeah. Um, one of the biggest things that I think as a society we need to do is break that stigma that somebody with dementia can't continue to learn. So for example, what we did is we empowered our residents to actually put together a um, resident hiring committee. What this is is if you were to apply in our community, mm -hmm. whether you're a housekeeper or an executive director, yeah. your resume is reviewed with our residents, yeah. and then we have a resident that actually comes up and will interview you. So a resident advocate that has dementia will come up, they'll get dressed up for the interview. Yeah. And the questions that they might ask is, what can you do for me in my community? Sure. So throughout that process, you get to actually see the person flourish in a, a great environment. And, also, and that's across all the people that you hire? Yep. So if you come in to um, be a caregiver, you'll yeah. be interviewed by somebody with dementia. First, you'll have the traditional interview, and then somebody with dementia will come up and ask you a few questions as well. I see. I see. And, and you tell, tell me again about how those interviews work. And is it just the person with dementia and the p potential employee, or is it somebody else from staff that is there also? Yep, so we have a resident engagement director. That mm -hmm. person's um, true mission is to really make the, the community as vibrant as possible by getting everybody engaged. Yeah. So they'll be there to help facilitate some of the questions if they need the help. Yeah. What we notice, though, is um, even residents that have difficulty communicating, when they get in that right environment, they just start to communicate and you see no signs of dementia, um, which is really yeah. fascinating. That's a fascinating thing. So, so for, for, my, for my folks who, have, who have, are worried about dementia, who may have dementia, or somebody is, in, is their caregiver is taking care of them at home right now, right? So if they are living at home right now, what can you tell them about, what can you tell both of them about how their lives can flourish while they're still at home? Definitely. I would definitely say stay involved in society as much as possible, mm -hmm. whether it's going to a movie. Um, there's great evidence out there that shows that people, when they stay engaged, you mm -hmm. can slow down the disease process organically or their signs and symptoms. Mm -hmm. um, the way this works is that if you are engaged in the moment, not thinking of the future or the past, yeah. which the buzzword right now is mindfulness, staying mindfulness. in the moment. Well, it, it's because it's the Buddhist term. You know, yes. that's, 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 I'm, I'm amazed by talking to clients and talking to caregivers saying, you know, 
as a caregiver, you may be able to really help yourself by reading a little bit about this stuff, reading about meditation, because that's where you aspire to be. Definitely. It's actually one of the Jesuit principles regarding kind of meditation that's what in the Jesuit community is aspiring to be in the moment, you know. Definitely. And what we notice is the residents that stay engaged do decline at a slower rate. Mm -hmm. But how this works scientifically is that um, in our body we have something called telomeres, which are attached to our DNA. So our telomeres. Telomeres. So now you're talking. Again, most of the most reason why many of us went to law school was because we couldn't <laughs> do the science, right? So you got to be slow with me. So um, what it is is um, our DNA that has that spiral. Yeah. At the end of the spiral, we have telomeres. They're like shoelaces. Yeah. As we age, we become disengaged. They get shorter, shorter, and shorter. Yeah. When they get shorter, it compromises our immune system, increases your chances of cancer, also increases your chances of developing dementia. I see. For those that already have dementia, they have shorter telomeres, but also if they stay engaged, you can reverse that and start to lengthen those telomeres. This is truly keeping a resident in the moment. So something we teach on is um, quilting a conversation. Say that you were- Quilting a conversation. So if you were my loved one, or yep. I was with a group of residents, yep. I would be the stitcher and I'd quilt that conversation together. So. Um, what yeah, I might say. I was say. just going to say, give me an example of what that means. So I could say, hey everybody, my name's Josh. Today we're going to be talking about baseball. Who here likes baseball? Red Sox, Yankees. Okay, have you ever been to New York City? I keep that conversation going and I include them. What you'll notice is around the 15 minute mark, yeah. they'll start to participate more and more. You're getting those synapses to start working in the brain. Because, because, the, because you've, you've engaged them in so many different ways. So tell me, Step back for a second. What yeah. happens during those 15 minutes? So you've talked about Red Sox, Yankees. Mm -hmm. Has anyone been to New York? And then give me an example of where does it go from there? It what? goes wherever they want it to go. So at first it's kind of yes, no, or just to, do you like Red Sox or Yankees? Do you like New York or Boston? And is that yes, no, because you're doing that intentionally or that just tends to be the kind of response you're getting? It's just uh, intentionally at the beginning. Yeah. You want to give those simple questions. Yeah. And then as that conversation starts to move forward, you'll notice people will say, wow, I love Boston. I've been on the duck tours. Have you ever done this? And they start to open more and more. You're, it's, it's like a hybrid car. The electric's in, and then the gas kicks in, and yeah. it really starts a great conversation. Although this also sounds like a pretty normal conversation among people, who, some of whom are shy, that Definitely. you start off with these kind of very, very tentative comments, and then people get more engaged, and they start being more interested. Definitely. What we've noticed is we have pictures all throughout our communities. So yeah. for um, oftentimes our residents have many questions while they're walking down the hall. Where am I? What am I doing? But if you can keep them engaged on those pictures, they're not asking those questions. You're having a, a real event with your resident all the way down the hall. So you talk about this beach. Have you ever been to the beach before? Do you like to go to the beach? Because or, the, the beach, because the pictures are really designed to stimulate certain kinds of conversations. Yes. Uh, wow. so, so walking down the hall, you'll see residents engaged versus yeah. just walking down a hall. Um, and that's what we call quilting. But the whole idea behind it is mindfulness. We're keeping our residents in the moment. That's a pretty amazing thing. That's a pretty amazing. So if, if you were thinking about that and how you, one would adapt that to being at home, what would you do? How would you, how would you cause the home environment, from what you know of it, to change, right, in order to have some of those characteristics to it? Definitely. Um, that's, you, a fair, that's a fair question. Yeah, yeah. definitely. You want to keep your home engaging. Um, one thing I see that people make as a mistake is they find their loved one has dementia. They learn that a lot of falls are related to dementia. They remove all the furniture. They duct tape rugs down. The environment... By the way, that is exactly the recommendation that I got from a person who, who is a woman, it was a nurse, she calls herself the, uh, was it the nurse carpenter. They try <laughs> to help people to adapt their homes in order to make the homes more safe, and those are the kinds of recommendations. That Definitely. I always suggest trying to keep it as home-like as possible, so you mm -hmm. want it to be familiar, but also have picture books out, um, even pictures of families. Um, you want to keep the environment engaging. Also include, include your loved one as much as possible in cleaning the dishes, cooking meals. Mm -hmm. Just because somebody has dementia doesn't mean that they can't help cook a meal. You could have them hold the spices or help um, marinate the, the chicken. You can have yeah. them do stuff still. Um, and I'm sorry if I'm getting a little bit f too far, uh, far ahead, but there's a place in Holland called the Dementia Village where people live independently. Talk, talk about the Dementia Village a little. So in Holland, they have a village with about 128 residents. They have their own shopping markets, their own grocery stores. They're encouraged to live independently as possible. Mm -hmm. They're supported too. 
So um, they actually go shopping for themselves. They go to, out to eat um, by themselves. Everybody in the community is trained to work with people with dementia. And the research shows that they can decline up to five times slower there than they do here typically in America. And that's because it's a use it or lose it, and we want to reinforce those skills. Mm -hmm. So I always suggest to families that... Um, so this is a community that is financed by the government? That is, I always think of it when it's, if it's the Netherlands, it's like, I always think of government. Yeah. Right? So it is, it is um, funded by the government, yeah. and they actually, it's a big research uh, model. So a lot of them go in and they'll actually judge people's, um, or measure people's progress on many mental exams. Because it's really been done, among other things, as a research model so that the world can understand how this might work. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. And I believe when I was at a conference a few months ago that they're going to be building one in California, which mm -hmm. will be fascinating to see how it works here in America. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but I always suggest to people, um, don't jump in and brush your loved one's teeth or do their hair or do their laundry. Try to empower them as much as possible to, um, to, to keep those skills. Right. And I suppose it, it must, but it must take a lot of mental discipline to be doing that because you're always tending to say, well, geez, you know, if they can't do it, especially if they can't do it quickly, I'll just help them. You Definitely. Know, or we'll just take care of what, you know, they don't have to be doing this. Uh, like oftentimes when I do training with um, with our associates, oftentimes I tell them to step back for a minute, watch the resident. Oftentimes you see them struggle just a little bit, and our tendency is to jump in and help them. Um, but right. oftentimes if you just take a moment and watch, typically it takes them a few a few tries, but then yeah. they do it themselves. Through all this process, uh, procedural learning, they can actually yeah. develop new skills. So for you and I, it takes 21 days. For a resident with dementia, it takes 35 days. So for them to repeatedly do that for 35 days, they can pick up a new skill. I see. You're just picking it up kinesthetically. You're picking up through a whole bunch of, whole bunch of different ways. Definitely. A whole yeah. bunch of different ways. Now, are, do you know of any communities where the, where the Council on Aging or where the kind of the players in the community are consciously trying to help folks who are caregivers in the home try to do, do this and so, that, so that folks can, because it sounds like a, a wonderful model, but something where the caregivers would constantly need to be talking to folks Definitely. and saying basically, so, you know, if this happened today, what do I do now, you know, because you, cause you get kind of intimidated. You Definitely. Know? Um, I always say reach out to your Council on Agings or um, yeah. even uh, assisted living if they're in your community, ask if they have a support group or yeah. an education series. I know, for example, I do a three-part education series at each of our communities, so mm -hmm. I bounce around and I do a lot of training mm -hmm. to help them uh, take the tools and resources and bring them home. Um, I must say the, the one question that people always bring up is um, mm -hmm. wandering. They're nervous about their loved one wandering outside. Sure. One thing that's been working really well is actually people with dementia typically don't like dark spaces. So in the evening, if you unscrew light bulbs in rooms that have exit doors, typically your loved one won't walk through that room to go outside. So it's more of a non-pharmacological way. Yeah. Or putting lights in rooms you want them to go into. So the bathroom have a night light so when they wake up, they can identify where to go. I see. And I see. Because that's just going to trigger that you're going to be attracted to the light. Definitely. You're really going to avoid the darkness. Yeah. And a, a, a great thing I always make sure people know is if your loved one walks out the front door, which might happen, um, they're more likely to go in the direction of their dominant hand. So if you go to look for your mom or father or um, spouse outside, yeah. typically if they went outside, they're going to walk in the direction of the dominant, their dominant hand, hand. So you can find them as well. That's a great piece of that's a great piece of trivia. Now, before we started the show, you were talking to me a little bit about music, and about the, the, the some of the, the research that you that you folks are doing in conjunction with Harvard. Can you tell me kind of a little bit about that? Definitely. So I'm a music therapist by trade, so I, I yeah. love to use music. Um, sundowning, which most um, people with dementia um, experience, it happens because they wake up in the morning or they're about to go to bed and the sun's going down or coming up and they get confused. So their body is releasing a different pool of chemicals. Yeah. Um, oftentimes people will take melatonin or another medication in the evening to help them go to, be able to go to sleep. Yeah. So what we've done is we've used music at different parts of the day to get them to wake up, to avoid sundowning in the morning or to go to bed in the evening. So um, well-known instrumental music releases serotonin in the body that wakes you up. Yeah. So if it's a well-known song that's instrumental, like somewhere over the rainbow jazz quartet, that's waking them up for the day. I see. And does it, so it, it doesn't necessarily need to be a song that they know the words to, just a song that, I guess, you, and you're saying because it's well-known, therefore you can assume that they know it. Right? Yeah. So, so, the, so in the ideal individualized case, you'd actually try to find the music that they know yep. and try to build that in. And typically yeah. that's the music from 18 to 25. It's called the client preferred music in music therapy. 
So if the, you the, the music that they heard when they were ages eighteen to twenty five. Yep. So if you that makes sense. Those are most of the songs I still remember. Yeah. Right. So yeah. The, those um, those songs actually, as they sing along, releases serotonin. Yeah. And then in the evening, we use non biharmonic music, which is just a fancy term for just a violin or just a cello, not a piano. That's two things at once. Yeah. When your brain hears just a, um, a simple melody, it releases melatonin and dopamine. So, so it's just hearing one instrument, it's a solo instrument. Yep. So like a guitar would also work because it's just one. A guitar has multiple sounds, so it's harmonic. I see. So just a violin, just cello, clarinet, or even a trumpet, those sounds um, release melatonin and dopamine. So melatonin will make you sleepy and dopamine yeah. motivates you to go to bed. Yeah. Um, another one that we use in the middle of the day is we use instrumental music not well known. What we've noticed is our residents, if it's well known, they're singing along as they're trying to eat, so it increases their chances of choking. But mostly, it takes away from social stimulation. If they're singing along, they're not focusing at those at their table. Right. So, um, so you're consciously looking for music that they wouldn't necessarily yep. know. So in the morning, we use music that they know, in mm -hmm. the afternoon, music that they don't know, and then yeah. the evening, just non-biharmonic non music. And in the, in the environment in your assisted living communities, is there always music? Yep. So we try to have music throughout the community, even when you first walk through the door. Mm -hmm. um, there are quiet areas, such in the libraries or certain places throughout our reflections program. Yeah. Um, but really, when you have music, it gets rid of that stagnant feeling. There's just stuff going on. That's a pretty amazing thing. Yeah. That's an amazing thing. And so, and tell me about the relationship between you and the folks at Harvard. Is there a particular researcher there that is work, who is working with you and they're looking at specific things? Yes, yeah, so um, we actually have um, some people from Harvard that come in and they'll do public speaking for families mm -hmm. and friends if they want to learn more. Also, they give us a lot of suggestions on what to do for mindfulness programs. Um, we have a collaboration that we use novelty learning, uh, mindfulness, tai chi, that we work into our daily program. In addition is that um, they come in and they do some training. So just last Thursday, we did an expressive arts therapy training. Yeah. And Megan Sturl um, came in and did an um, amazing presentation on how to incorporate mindfulness into our communities. So they do a train the trainer where then our associates go back and actually do mindfulness practices with our residents. I see. I see. And that happens kind of throughout the community? Yep. So oftentimes we'll, we'll all get together and they'll mm -hmm. come in and train all of our associates and then they go back and they train all of their department heads and their frontline associates. And that also sounds like a model that if you get it right in the assisted living community is really applicable in the broader community also. So it's something that through, I, I keep thinking of the Council on Aging as really being mm -hmm. kind of the linchpin to a lot of this, for to be able to help a lot of folks to stay at home. And really having I think what's so exciting about the assisted living is like what you're talking about is that you, you've got this rising level of knowledge because they're all experimenting also. And so you're constantly trying to get ahead in terms of kind of what we know. Definitely. Is, that's, all, that's all really cool. My biggest thing is that we just launched a, a new dementia training. So mm -hmm. when um, people first come on board, they go through an eight-hour training that's mm -hmm. specialized just kind of towards our our, what our philosophy, what yeah. we've learned, our Harvard collaboration. Yeah. And then in addition is they go through an, another eight hour training with me, so they're getting about 16 hours. And to see those light bulbs go off is really, that's really why I'm in this field. I love to see that, oh yeah, this is how we can help Mrs. Smith. Right. Um, right. It's, it's really cool. That is very cool. So it, from the experience that you've had, can you see new areas opening up of, of, tr of training for folks or of ways in which you can make the life of a, dementia, of a person with dementia more rich? Definitely. Where is that going? So uh, it's fascinating to see a bunch of different philosophies kind of coming aboard. So yeah. um, I dabbled quite a bit to um, write my, I wrote a book recently called The Dementia Concept, where I studied color and how it can influence people's The smells. Dementia Concept? Yep. Um, By the way, we will have a little, we'll, we'll let you know if you want to read that book. We'll have that information on the, at, the, at the end of the program. If oh, you could you. bring that in. Good. I definitely will. So, for example, the, um, I don't get royalties on this. <laughs> <laughs> um, colors can influence someone with dementia. Yeah. So, for example, the whole industry went to red plates because red plates increase appetite. However, when you really look at it, that's making people overeat. So, to really take a step back and really look into that, also, dark blue plates suppress appetite. So, if somebody's overeating, you'll put their food on a dark blue plate. We didn't want to have people over or under eat, so we used a yellow plate. Yellow actually makes you salivate, so it makes you hungry, but it also holds attention. So the yellow plate also provides contrast, so if you have Italian food, there's contrast on it, 
basically there's not many foods that are yellow, so there's right. always contrast, right. um, which we've seen work really well for us. Or, for example, the color black. Um, people with dementia typically don't pay attention to the color black or don't prefer it. So what you'll notice is a lot of assisted livings will put black mats in front of doors, and that will be perceived as a hole, and they won't walk across it. Right. I, I don't suggest that to anyone because I think it's a scare tactic. But what we've done is we've had residents that don't come out of bed sometimes, and the, the thing, the fallbacks always give them an antidepressant, try to get them out of bed. So right. what we've done is put a black sheet on the bed, for example, put all their linens over it. When they get up to brush their teeth, pull them off, put them in. Then when they walk out of the room, they don't pay attention to the bed, and they come out and they just participate. I see. So um, see. it's fascinating kind of how colors can influence people, or the color lime green is actually the last color we lose the ability to see. So we put lime a, green. Yeah. So we put all. Oh, of, too bad. Not a great <laughs> color. Oh. Um, so we put all of our associates' uniforms in lime green. What yeah. this did is it allowed our residents to identify who to go to when they need to use the bathroom, or they're wandering, or right. they just need some help. So you see a decrease in kind of those behaviors because they can see who to go to. Right. That is just really fascinating. I guess what, what what's so fascinating to me is to realize how much research is happening. Um, how quickly it's happening and how it's going in the direction which is the direction which most people want to go which is towards independence right mm -hmm. whether it is in a community like an assisted living community like yours or at home and having people who are caregivers be able to share that information to be able to help everybody definitely so uh, I bet you enjoyed this uh, it was truly fascinating for me I'm gonna make sure that we get Josh Freitas uh, information regarding his book uh, and a little bit about his communities, or about the communities where he works, so that you can learn about it. I hope this was of interest to you. I think it's something that's going to, there's going to be a subject of real uh, discussion in a number of communities as we try to figure out how to make communities more dementia friendly, whether in the assisted livings or in the, in the broader communities. Thanks very much, Josh Freitas, for Thank uh, you joining well. me. And uh, we'll see you next time in the next installment of Bergeron Briefs. Thank you. Thank you.